Welcome to the first of seven live stream traversal broadcasts from the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I am Dini Grigar, the director of this lab and professor in the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program here at the University. We kick off our series with Sarah Smith's Hypertext, Hypertext Narrative, King of Space. This event is part of the Born Digital Media Preservation Series that's in celebration of the Electronic Literature Organization's move from MIT to Washington State University, Vancouver. It's sponsored by WSUV, um, WSU, WSU's Lewis E. and Stella B. Buchanan Distinguished Professorship, and of course, Electronic Literature Organization. In the online audience today, we have my collaborator, Stuart Malthrop, coming in from Wisconsin. We also have Sarah Smith, the author, who's coming in from Brookline, Massachusetts, and the artist, uh, Matthew Mattingly, coming in also from Mass Massachusetts. In the face-to-face -face audience, we have um, our affiliate person, uh, faculty, um, Philippe Brand, who's in from Lewis and Clark uh, College, as well as faculty members John Barber and Ted Fordyce, and many of our wonderful students in the CMDC program. I want to thank everybody for attending today. You're probably wondering what a traversal is. Well, this is a process that Stuart and I created for the Pathfinders Project. It involves um, audio and video performances that are performed on legacy computers, what we consider historically appropriate machines or platforms by an author and readers of a work. This Pathfinders methodology was created for preserving media-rich and interactive works that cannot be reproduced in print, that cannot be preserved in any way um, in writing. It also includes, along with the traversal, many other components, including photographs of the material artifact. It also includes sound files. It includes essays, bios, and um, essays about the historical impact of the work itself. Today we are live streaming this traversal, and we are also capturing your responses in social media. All of this content will be um, combined and put into the websites, the Electronic Literature Lab site, as well as the Pathfinders website. We also plan to publish this as an online, as an online book. Um, when we work with legacy mach machines, there's some things you'll notice. For example, there's going to be some flickering on the screen periodically, and that's because of the refresh rate. Uh, it's very different from the legacy computer and the current contemporary uh, equipment that we're using. You'll also notice a glare periodically. These things will try to mitigate, but this is just part of the environment. You'll also hear a humming sound. That's part of this particular computer, which is a PowerPC um, Performa 5215 CD, and that machine makes a really specific hum, and we're going to be hearing that throughout the entire performance, and I do not apologize for that. Um, assisting today in the lab is Nicholas Schiller. He's associate director of this lab, and he's also a tenured faculty member in the library. Greg Philbrook has been working really hard to make this work with me. Um, he is our technology specialist, our guru in the program. We also have Vanessa Rhodes, who is the ELET um, uh, researcher in this space. Uh, Mariah Gwynn, who's our, our games researcher, and also Veronica Whitney, who's doing all the editorial work in the catalog. I want to also thank uh, our sponsors who provided this support. Our traversal is performed by my colleague, Amber Strother. She is a Blackburn, the Blackburn Fellow at Washington State University, Vancouver, where she specializes in contemporary American literature, gender and sexuality studies, and speculative fiction. Her research interests include the intersection of body and technology, images of reproductive body, and media studies. And you'll see, her, see as she moves along in this traversal why she's the perfect person to do this traversal for us. She was the Electronic Literature Organization's Marjorie C. Lusenbrink Fellow in 2016, and she's trained at DHSI and Digital Humanities. She's a member of the Electronic Liter Literature Organization and the MLA. She's currently teaching at WSU courses like feminist science fiction and technology and Southern Gothic literature. The link to this stream will be archived at the L website as well as the YouTube site that you're currently on if you're online right now. Our Facebook channel and Twitter hashtag are both hashtag ELIT Pathfinders. Amber will perform her work for approximately about 30 minutes and will follow that performance with questions and answers. So if you post to social media, she will respond to those questions and we'll try to help her moderate that. So let's get started. Thank you once again for being with us today. I'm going to let Amber have this seat.
Okay, so um, before I start the traversal, I want to talk a little bit about um, a conversation I had with Sarah Smith yesterday and her inspiration for the piece. Um, she was very inspired by quilting and collage, choose your own adventure stories, and you'll see a lot of this as I move through the work, but also the idea of blurring characters together. So instead of having one character tell the whole narrative, blurring in between them. Um, this narrative is told by various characters who are both male and female, as well as human and non-human. So you're going to see a little bit of both of that. She also discussed the creation of the piece. Um, King Space was actually, King Rider was created for King Space by Mark Bernstein, and it requires HyperCard 2.0 to run. In addition, Matthew Mattingly, um, who is an artist that Dini mentioned, created the ASCII art, and it's very pretty. So this is what you see when you open King of Space, and we're just going to click on this. Okay, so before we enter the piece, I want to talk about some of the choices you have when you get to this interface. Um, at the bottom here, you'll see you have four choices. Um, hypertext theory gives you kind of a little bit of background about critical issues and hypermedia. So when you click on it, you get just a brief introduction to that. Playing the game explains the mechanics of it. So some of the different elements include mazes and puzzles, as well as um, games and animation. And so you're just getting a little bit of background. And so that you're familiar with the story, because obviously I won't have time to, traver to traverse the entire work, I'm going to read a little bit of the story background to you. So 50 years ago, Nicholson's plague devastated the asteroids. The plague made its victims mindlessly loyal to anyone who gave off a tailored row pheromone. Its effects are hereditary. The Terran Empire has quarantined the asteroids. So the main character that you start with is Tam Ross, and he's a rebel against the Terrans who's been bred for resistance to the plague. Escaping from prison, he finds the derelict great ship Lady Knee. The Knee could save his revolution, but to get to it, he must fight King Brady, the only human aboard the ship, and the ship's half-mad interface, the Lady Knee herself, Brady's lover. Tamros is himself being hunted by the virgin priestess of Palas, the, the Roe Pheromone. She needs, her, she needs a lover, bodyguard, and slave. Tamros needs her bioengineering skill. And so to move forward, you click this button at the bottom. But the priestesses of Palas are part of a fertility cult. To gain her powers, the priestess must lose her virginity, and the plague is spread sexually. So it kind of asks you to think about how resistant is Tamros to this plague and how resourceful he is. And it tells you how to start the narrative. And at the bottom, um, it has a note because it contains scenes of sex and violence. So please keep it away from children who use your computer. <laughs> <laughs> and it is very full of sex and violence. Um, at the bottom, you'll also notice there are these tabs that say all text is a game. And each one leads you to a different um, playthrough that is connected to the narrative but kind of on its own individually a part of the narrative. So we're going to look at text because um, it's my favorite. <laughs> so this is the Lady Knee Horizator um, and it's an elevator basically and you have these options here where you can stop, open, close, wear, and go. So you can close the doors and you get this image of a tiger which is also a slide puzzle that you can uncover in the game. So you can tell it to um, go, and you'll see that the floors change. So it goes all the way up to the rim. Um, you can open the doors. You can tell it where you want to go. Oh, it's telling me I can't do that. So you have to close the door, and then you can click where. And you get this kind of uh, generative poetry. So you can tell it where to go by putting in a number um, and click do it, and then you get kind of neat, oh, it hates me, stop, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to read the poem, <laughs> okay, so you can tell it where to go, we'll try a different number, and tell it to do it, and you get this, you can hopefully hear the sound, but you get these um, poems, so I can hear the robots singing each to each, the revolution reaches beyond descent to nihilism and anarchy. Seeing the body electric. Freedom is not a commodity that is given to the enslaved upon demand. I like the I like the sound. Robots never, never, never shall be slaves. Thank you. Good day. 
And so each time I've done it, I've gotten a different poem or a different combination of some of those um, screens. Then when you're ready to leave, you have to stop it, um, open the door, and tell it to exit. So when you exit the Horizator, you get to this other part that really illustrates the gaming aspect of it. Um, you go into the kitchen, so by clicking useful, and I'm not going to go all the way through it because it's fairly long and I want to get to the narrative, but you get the rules of the kitchen which explain the game to you. Um, and when you move forward, basically it's telling you you have to make Japanese tea and find the cucumber sandwiches. So you move through a series of choices. Um, you have to find the teapot, fill it with water, figure out how to turn the burner on, and then find the sandwiches or eat the cherry pie. There's one option where you can eat cherry pie. So to get back to the initial screen, you just hit restart. But you can go through each of these, um, and each one is different, and each one in some way connects to the larger narrative, but offers you kind of a way to play around and make some choices and generate your own version of um, poetry or narrative. It's, it's a lot of fun. So we'll go back to the main screen. Um, and start with the text. So then we begin King of Space. I'm going to click through some screens fairly quickly. Um, I read the background so that I wouldn't have to go through the initial screens and I can get more into where you're actually allowed to make choices and where some of the imagery that has to do with wombs and reproduction, which as Deanie said is my favorite part, um, where we can talk about some of the images of the priestess and Lady Me. So you get this introduction. Um, explains some of the background in more detail, talks about the plague. I don't know if you can hear me over the sound of the game, so I'm going to try to talk louder. Okay. Um, you get Tam Ross, who is in his ship. He's dreaming. He's traveling. So you're getting some of the ASCII art that's on the sides there. Um, it's very female, um, womb-oriented. He's having this dream about water, he's traveling in his ship, he's having kind of memories and dreams about what's happened to him, and finally he wakes up. So the first task you're kind of challenged with is to find air, um, and so we get, he has a dream about not being able to breathe, and when he wakes up, he has a low supply of oxygen. So the first thing you have to do is start to try to find some kind of oxygen tank. Okay, so this is an example of one of the puzzles you have to solve. So it's the control panel, or at least that's what I'm calling it. Um, and you have to figure out how to get it to work. So turn the battery on. You turn the radar on, and then you have to lock on um, this image here. And once you do that, it takes just a second, and then you get to go to the next screen. So it tells you that you've actually locked on. Um, he, he spots a ship, so we will continue. And it's Lady Me, Hermes class great ship. And you get a warning that it's been abandoned because it may be contaminated by the plague. So there's this really neat um, vessel map here. And you see Tam Ross's ship. You see the life ship, um, which is much smaller, obviously. And then all of these areas here are connected. They're the main ship, the great ship. Um, I did ask if you could go to all of these places, and you can't go to all of them, and I haven't found all of them yet, but you can go to a lot of them, um, and there's the kitchen in the very middle, and that's where you make the sandwiches. So when you back out of this screen, when you click forward here, you get more information about the plague, about the ship, um, and it explains to you, oh, you get this beautiful animation there. So then you get an explanation of the life ship versus the great ship. So life ships are full of genetic material. The little white moon can restock an entire planet. It can restock a great ship. So when you go to the next screen, you're at one of the first choices you get to make. So after, you know, you have the puzzle that you solved and then you get to where you're actually making your own choices. You learn more about the priestess and her red king. Um, the priestess with her powers controls life and death in the rocks. The Red King is her lover, her helper, her bodyguard. A condemned criminal, a violent man, he is linked to her by bonds as strong as life. They're trouble, but so is Tam. So then you have to choose between the life ship and the great ship. If you go to the great ship, you are just on the great ship. There's no coming back. 
um, but we know the live ship has the potential to kind of restore some of the, the uses of the great ship. So I'm going to go there because I know there's a lot of imagery in that um, that has to do with the priestess, and I'd like to go there first. At the door of the life ship, he looks around warily, drawing his heart's blood knife from its sheath. The ship of the fertile worlds is smooth and white inside, brightly lit the inside of a star's egg. Its smell is strange, cool, intoxicating. So he finds a girl lying in the middle of it. Um, and I'm not sure that we'll see Lady Knee. I don't think that this goes to that part. But there's this contrast between this very young um, princess, priestess, and Lady Knee, who is not only the ship, but also an older woman. So then you have some more art that shows you um, the priestess laying in her kind of egg-shaped resting place. She's encased in a half moon of ice and sparkles of silver ray out from her body. Her skin is the dusky color of twilight on the fertile worlds and on it faintly glow, faintly glow stars. Piercing her right ear is a silver, silver earring in the shape of a sickle moon. And this image of the moon and the sickle moon kind of continues throughout the piece and you see it come up over and over. One of the neat things is that um, this is a religion based um, the priestesses are part of a religion and you get these italicized pieces which are scriptures and they're very poetic and very pretty so the emperor mated with Terra and their daughter was space space is a virgin whose skin is dark and whose body is covered with stars the moon hangs in her ear in her womb are all the seeds of life so this image of the seeds and of reproduction carries throughout everything I've seen of the piece so far and this need for her to establish a red king. So because she was lonely for a lover, she made a man out of Mars dust and by concourse with her in the ceremony, he gains life. He is the red king, the trickster, but he is also her true love, mated to space for life. And this kind of reinforced that the, the permanence of the red king is mated to space for life. And we have more of this image, um, more kind of returning to the idea of the thin sickle of silver in the earring, kind of reinforcing her virginity. A priestess on her virgin voyage finds a man and mates with him. After sex, she gets her power. Sex is magic. So sex is talked about a lot as being magical, as being dangerous, as being this permanent connection. Um, and then at the end, we have this idea of being mated again, mated to space. No, mated to her for life. So then you get to another choice. Um, and some of the choices, you're just given the illusion of choice. So you can make your choice and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And it will tell you, well, you have to do it. It takes you back to a screen and you have to choose again. In this one, um, you are choosing about your interaction with the priestess. So you have these three choices. The ceremony ritual is just an excuse. Remove the earring, removing the earring is key to her powers. He'll try that, then talk with her rationally. My favorite selection, sex with this woman would be like a dangerous drug. It's been a long time since he had a dangerous drug. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in her line. Um, he has sexual power too. Her powers depend on him. He can control the situation. So you can choose any of these, um, but I'm of course going to choose this middle one here. So then it moves um, through this image of him coming closer to her. Um, it talks, it has these really beautiful images, um, like this one here at the end. He knows it's a trick, sense of grass and vegetables mingling with the smell of woman sex, but it makes him want to roll with her in that grass. He can smell the crushed scent of it underneath their bodies. So these very fertile, um, natural images to some degree. He wants to worship her, to protect her. He wants to give her, whole, her his whole loyalty. The feeling is as strong as the smell inside his head. So this idea that the, the smell kind of reverberates through this section. So she sits up and he tries not to look at the stars that glow on her. Then we see some kind of um, traditional sci-fi imagery with some, you know, slimy imagery maybe. She shakes the drops of jelly from her dusky skin. She looks up and down. She is seeing his jumpsuit, the red of Circe prison. And so 
he starts to have this idea that maybe his feelings aren't his own and there's this pool of the knee and the pool of um, the priestess that you see in different parts of the narrative. So you have some really um, beautiful little animation here. She begins to pick seeds from the shoulder of his suit. These will grow here. Give them to me. So then you can choose to give her the seeds or not to give her the seeds. I will choose not to. Um, so he doesn't believe in her religion. He's really trying to resist. He's trying to resist the pull of the priestess, but it's inevitable. You know, he's not going to be able to. And um, we have this idea of politics as pornography. People act as if their brains were between their legs. So he's he's kind of powerless to resist this priestess. So I want to see if I can get to some different parts. I'm going to click through a few screens and see if I can get to some more choices. You also get to um, these screens, so I guess I'll point this out. You have these little blocks here that almost look like books, and it, on different screens, different ones flash. And I haven't quite figured out what the significance of that is or what causes them to, to flash or if it's just particular screens, um, but this is a good example of what it looks like. And they're throughout different parts of the narrative. We get this image of the ship being battered, um, which is a repeating screen. I've seen it in a few different places, that the idea that this ship is abandoned. So it's this contrast of the image of kind of battered, decaying ship with the inside where you have this fertility. So here is the slide puzzle. Um, I have successfully completed the slide puzzle once and caused the, thing to, caused the whole thing to crash. And one time it did not. But you have these choices between the maintenance panel and the inner ship communicator. And while you can't really go back very far, I want to point out that there is a history that logs the screens you're on. So you can go back a few pages and try to make different choices. Um, and so unfortunately, I think I have hit an end because I see the airlock. And usually when you see the airlock on the screen, it, it is um, signifying that you have reached, you're about to hit a black screen. So. Um, the leaves of the airlock iris slowly open, creaking like a frog print in a foul mood. <laughs> yeah, so there is our black screen. So you can try to go back and see if it will let me choose. Maybe the maintenance panel. No, we're going to end up at the same place. So at this point, you have the option to restart. Um, you can play through some of these other pieces or can start over. Do you want me to keep traversing? Okay. So we'll start over. Let's see if I can click through. I look very polished at doing this now, but this is from <laughs> practice. It took me <laughs> some time to figure out how to get through to where I want to go. I'm going to try to go to the great ship this time. Um, here we go. So I'll choose this one and see if you can see. So um, he decides that he shouldn't go to the great ship, but instead he's going to go, I mean, he shouldn't go to the life ship. Instead, he's going to go to the great ship. So he climbs into his skin tight. He goes over. He gets inside the great ship. It's also scarred from meteors and hard radiation. This is the exact same screen that you see with the life ship. So both ships have been damaged um, by being in space. And we're back here, but let's see if we can go to a different place. Yeah. So here's a good example of a place where it seems like you have a choice. So it says he slips his knife into its external sheath and keeps working on the lock, but his right hand is clumsy with the cold. His left is useless. So he's beginning to shake and he you can try to go back to the life ship. And when you click this, it says, you stagger down the ship corridor toward the life ship, but he's already so cold that his legs won't hold him. And when you move forward, you have no choice but to yell at the comm box. So when you do that, um, get into the, the comm box. You say, favor, I'm asking a favor, let me in. And if you click on favor, you kind of have an understanding of what the favor actually is. So it's kind of um, an encyclopedia entry or kind of just an explanation of the term. And there's one screen, and I can't really remember how I got to it, um, but it's, <laughs> it's in the library. There's a place where you can choose to go to different rooms, and you can go to the library. And if you go to the library, there are maybe 10 to 15 terms, and you can click on them, and this is one of them. So I assume that you get them throughout the game. Um, but she told us yesterday, did she say 200 and 
There's 317. 317 screens, and the highest number I've seen, not that I've been through all of them, is 251. Plus, each screen has the potential to have like A, B, C, and D. So, I haven't been to all of the screens, obviously, but once you finish, you click the readout ends, and you can move forward in the narrative. So I'm at the airlock again. The leaves of the airlock iris force themselves slowly open as if they are doing something unnatural, moving against the flow of time. Oh, I didn't I didn't get sucked out of the airlock, I guess. So I'm moving forward. Um Okay. So here you meet King Brady, who um, is attached to the lady need. So he's attached to the ship, and he has a pretty disgusting description here. Lights crawl in his matted gray hair, his body smells, he is spider thin, a man who has spent his life in low gravity. His yellow skin is smeared with dirt, old power wires are tangled into his hair, wires plated into a rough circle like a crown. He stares like a man who has seen too much infinitely alone. So he is an old king, right? And if you continue, um, Tam Ross and Brady interact. He tries to get in the Horizator. Talks. They talk to the ship. Um, they try to go to the Great Hall. So it's kind of him traversing parts of the ship, um, trying to locate. And so then suddenly it drops, which I think is a neat animation. Um, and you're smashed to the floor, and everything goes black. Hopefully the next screen is not just black. Yeah. So um, there's this idea of trying to kill him. Tam groans, brushes at his eyes as if he hasn't been awake long enough to hear. It's moving through this. There's a place where you get to search for things, and I'm hoping I get there. Um, we see the priestess, so no matter which way you go, you're going to end up running into the priestess, and here again, over her body are scattered seeds, and we get these images of glitter, little silver spangles. In one of the tabs at the bottom, I think it is, you get to choose color combinations. So by playing through the game, it helps you maybe figure out which combinations you should use. So silver is kind of an important um, recurring color in the text. So you have the virgin priestess and her sickle earring in her ear again. So even if you don't go to the life ship, you're still going to meet the priestess. Sleeping with her would be stronger and sweeter than any other woman in the system, but he wouldn't survive it, not the way he is now. So the priestess is transformative for him. She needs a red king. Um, when she sleeps with a red king, that's when she gets her power, and he is bound to her forever. So it's a servant of the priestess, but also of the empire. And so you go through these um, interactions with her where he's resisting, right? He doesn't want this, but then you're returned to this idea that he can't breathe. So how much air has he got left? So here we have, you can see this is blinking. So um, you move through this and the priestess is trying to convince you to do these things, to, you know, have sex with her. She talks about the ship and gives you more background about what's happening. Um, trying to get to the part where you actually start searching for your air. So we get this reinforcement of her powers over and over. Um, so here we go. You get some more choices. So this blatantly tells you that, you know, you're not really being given choices. Sure, he thinks, my choice. So you can give the priestess her powers. The way I figure it, our best chance is to reprogram the knee. You can say, I'm not cooperating with the priestess, but there may be weapons somewhere aboard or a ship I can use to escape. Or once Brady is dead, the knee may be more reasonable. Kill Brady. So I tried to kill Brady the first time I got here, so we'll try to kill him right now. But you can't, <laughs> you can't kill Brady. Suppose I killed Brady, and she says, you know, that he, Brady has the ship's favor. The lady knee protects him. She'll kill you. So I could reprogram her with my powers, leading you back to these choices where you can give the priestess her power because you think it's your best choice or where you're not cooperating. So we just won't cooperate to see what happens. So can he find weapons to use against the knee? The knee was a great ship. Some of the ships that were traveling with her should still be here. They may be armed. Where are they? So you have the map again. So you can look at the map again. You go back. You get more information about the ship. 
when you follow the Virgin. And a swarm of Koroks follow you through the maze of air tubes. Let me try, sorry. Let's see if I can get to. So he needs air and he needs heat. We're still at this point. So you can go back to the knee or you can try to look for auxiliary tanks going further into the troop carrier. So, okay. I actually found the screen I was looking for, which is kind of a miracle. Um, <laughs> so you click through it and you get to see different images of it and eventually you get to kind of this puzzle. So you have all of these different places you can search and many of them have things in them and many of them don't. So some of them, like this one, are just dark and cold and empty, but I know where the things are, so I'm going to show you. You have these choices. You can look for the air cylinders or you can take the software. If you look for the air cylinders, you don't get anything. So eventually, you have to take the software. So it's this whole um, puzzle and maze and this idea that you have choices, and sometimes you really do have choices, but sometimes you're just kind of forced into the actions that the piece wants you to take. So when you take the software, um, it moves you into a different direction. So I think I'll stop there. I've kind of given a good overview of all the different types of screens you can end up on. Okay, okay. so now it's time for a QA. and a So I guess I'll just ask questions from here. So, so in your experience, I'm gonna, I'll be off camera yeah. and you'll be answering on camera. So if you hear my voice, I'm the um, disembodied mm -hmm. voice of this <laughs> interview. So people are, are writing in to the Pathfinder's um, live traversal site and making comments about the animation and making comments about the ASCII art. Do you want to say a few things about how this, how those um, impact the way you read this text? The writing is fantastic, but how does that multimedia? I think, so I think that the different images consistently reinforce um, what's being said in the text. So you have all of these images of seeds and of kind of natural elements and a lot of the animations reinforce that like the little um, bugs that kind of flitter across you know the screen or the tiger kind of reinforcing that element of nature but then you also have screens like the one that I've stopped on that are very dark and reinforce kind of the darkness and the coldness of space and I think having those animations shows you the contrast in the work between this idea of like the fertile natural womb and the dark cold space. And so another another comment was made about the puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> How many puzzles did you come across, and um, what did those add to the content? Because that's a, that's a whole different genre in nested inside this narrative, right? Yeah. So. There's the control panel, which you can't move forward unless you figure out what to do. And I had to click a lot of different things and try to figure out about the thrusters and the ignition. Um, that one is pretty simple and it's early on. The tiger one was harder, the slide puzzle. Um, just those two. I can kind of quickly, since I won't actually go through it, pull up. So this is what the color choice one is, you know, and you get to choose your color combination and it takes you, it changes the text that shows up so it's generative text and so some of the colors get changed and if you do it long enough let's see if I can get it to show the other part yeah so eventually you get to this one um, and this is the one that I used to crash it multiple times yesterday <laughs> because there's so many color combinations you know and you can do all kinds of different things and certain ones bring up um, once you learn it like this one I think this one's very pretty because it talks about the ultraviolet and the shimmering intra infrared so it's a hard puzzle because you can click so many different combinations. Um, and I did get some cheating help from Sarah Smith to tell me that I had chosen the right combination, just not in the right order to get past the screen. Um, but it was what caused it to crash multiple times was me just clicking lots of different color combinations. So those are the only puzzles. Well, and then if you make the sandwiches. So to make the sandwiches, you first have to make the tea, and then you have to make choices about what you're going to pick in the sandwiches. Those are the only puzzles that I got to in my own traversal. Um, I'm not sure how many there actually are. Well, I guess there's also looking for the, uh, where you have to take the software. So, what was the second part of that question? Well, just how it, ha how it adds to the narrative content. I mean, what is, what's the connection between the puzzle and the storyline? And you're, I think you've answered that question. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I think this puzzle lets you be more of an active participant in what you generate because you choose the colors, and depending on what colors you choose, it changes what your text is. And you get, you know, it changes, you can change it just small changes, like maybe just specific colors are changed, but then that can also change the entire text, like this one did. Um, I think the tiger puzzle is really interesting because it forces you to slow down. It's very challenging, and it took me a few minutes to get it. And then you feel, when you move on past it, I think it is a system of reward in the text. Instead of just clicking and making choices, you're actually being asked to engage with it in a more direct way. And then um, when you like actually make it past the puzzle, there's this feeling of joy, like, I did it! Now I'm participating in this in a whole different way. So I think it's a different kind of hypertext because of the puzzle. Question anybody in this room? While we put it so it gets on to any questions? You mentioned the color silver. Mm -hmm. How does that relate back to the story? So her silver earring, mm -hmm. she has this crescent moon and there's um, a lot of talk of her kind of shimmering body, her silver shimmering body, and she has stars on her body that glow, and there's kind of this recurring image. He has a silver necklace, too. Tam Ross has a silver necklace that he wears, um, and that's actually one of the color combinations on here that gives you this image of the mirror. So I think it's more about, maybe also about the idea of the mirror tying into the silver, which you could go on for days about what a mirror could symbolize in a text, right? Any other questions? Sarah Smith wrote and said, John McCarthy played it once and got stuck on the whorehouse. The color combination game. <laughs> I was also stuck and would not have made it through without Sarah. So, I mean, maybe. I was trying to be very mathematical and choose, like, be very mathematical and go through every possible combination, but you have to choose two combinations back to back to move forward, and I won't tell you what it is in case you get to play it. I have a question for the audience, and I'll say this loudly. My question to you is you're looking at her performing this on a legacy computer, and it's the original diskette, and it's sitting right there, so we can pick that up and hold it in front of the camera. That is what the, the actual folio looks like, and inside is the computer diskette that this work is, you know, on. So how does you, how does looking at this on this computer change the way you think of the work? It's not an emulation like a game emulator. It's not a migration to CD. It's the original diskette. I, I think it makes me more, um, I, I guess, calling being intrigued by kind of the little, uh, not, not necessarily glitches, but like, like you said, like where kind of the the system breaks down and just kind of thinking about the constraint it makes me think a lot more about the constraints. The, yeah, the, the processes that the author had to use and had to master um, in order to create it. So this was created, um, this was, it's running on HyperCard 2 to a certain extent. It's drawing information from HyperCard 2, but it's produced in a handmade platform called KingMaker. KingWriter. KingWriter that mm -hmm. Mark Bernstein produced to make this. So KingWriter is the platform that's drawing also on HyperCard. I mean, this is 1991, free browser, free web, so to speak. And so it's a custom platform that's specific to this specific narrative. Is that yes. It was built, in fact, you can argue that this platform was built to match the needs of this narrative, which is totally different than anything you've experienced. That would be like a game maker saying, oh, Unity doesn't work for me. I'm going to create a whole new platform to create this game, right? And program it myself. That's what this is. This is that's what this is. Is do you know if the, the platform has been used was was used for other? I don't know. I don't think I don't think so. But I, that's my question to Mark Bernstein. And I was hoping he'd be online today, but I didn't see him. Anything else? I, I do have a question, yeah. also just in terms of like the original reception, like how how was this distributed? Like was there, I was about to ask was there a website, <laughs> but I guess not. But I mean how, you know, was there like an ad in the back of the magazine saying like send three ninety nine and here? Oh, that's such a great books. question. So I was a graduate student yeah. in 1990. This came out in 91. So I, when these came out, 
the first one I got was Michael Joyce's Afternoon Story. And when you open this up, you get the diskette, but inside the folio was advertisements for other works. So you'd pull out the old-fashioned way, the catalog, you'd mark the ones you wanted to buy, write a check, put it in an envelope, and mail it off. And about two weeks later, maybe, you'd get the one you ordered, the next one. And if you had enough money, you could order a lot at a time. These were $29.95, $25 to $30 each. And this was in 1991, so do the math. That's over $100 per bits. So these were spendy. Plus the Macintoshes cost about $2,500 to $3,000 each. So this was, talk about diversity issues and um, socioeconomic issues. To be able to afford this meant you had access and you had some money. Or you had the ability to get money to get this stuff. And you had to wait to get it. You'd mail in and it would come. When the web became um, mainstream through the browser, there was a website for eScape Systems, and then you could you could call it in, or you could order online. But we could call Mark, or we could send him a check. But we always had to send a check, right? Because we didn't have the ability to do shopping carts. It's interesting because I mean, when you think of, or when I think of, I grew up in a very large shoe store, and I think of like Payless, but I mean, it's a very, they're very cheap. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're very, it's a very cut and cut one. I mean, my parents bought the problem from us, but that's what we need to buy them to do. They were expensive, so we could, you know, and so it was a, a cheap and easy way to keep us occupied for a long time. So it's especially interesting to kind of contrast that. With well, this was actually, you have to think about it, who can afford this back then? In those days, you know, I was a graduate student, I had no money, but I, but I had to buy books. Graduate students spend money on books. This is what we do. We build a library. It's expected for you to do this out of your own pocket. The university does not give you money to build your library. So this was the cost of a book. So that's how I justified buying it. It's like, okay, I've got to either, I'm going to buy a book this week. Is it going to be this book, this thing, booky thing? <laughs> or is it a book, the book? Is it a book or a booky thing? And this is like buying a novel. Well, it's better because it's not the same experience every time you play through it. Like, as you could see, I was trying to get back to places I had been, but I don't always follow the same path to get to those places. So you kind of have to, you can click quickly through some things, but you get to certain choices. And, you know, if you make this choice, like if you choose not to solve that tiger puzzle, you go to a different place than if you choose to solve the tiger puzzle. So, you know, it's not just one book. It's like choose your own adventure. You can read through it and make different choices every time and it leads you to a different part. Well, some of the choices you get to actually make. Some of them just take you back and make you breed with the priestess. <laughs> <laughs> Are you aware of any uh, public library systems that ever show any of this? Or, or and access, you know, the, the, the system that would take them? A few. Yes, yeah, so the, Harvey Ran the Harry Ransom Library at University of Texas at Dallas has some, like Michael Joyce, they actually collected Michael Joyce's papers, but they have some other things. Um, and then uh, the Stanford Library has some Malloy. So mostly academic, like academic university library. libraries. Okay. I do not know, I haven't yet found any, but I haven't done a massive search, yeah. but I've gone through major libraries looking for Malloy, um, Michael Joyce, Stuart Malthrop. I've you know, looked to see the major authors to see where their works are located and it's academic research libraries because this required a computer and in 1991 libraries didn't have computers so why buy these and the library congress doesn't even have these really and so that's the sad thing so you know one of the things i'm trying we're trying to do in this lab is rectify some of these problems because if you are wanting to do this, you need read this work. This this isn't the only version you're going to get of it. This 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 get we only have kind of uh, a half of the get and it only runs on these kinds of computers. You don't have one of those. For her to do this research, she's going to have to borrow one and take it back to Coleman. <laughs> and, and I'm going to, which she's going to do. And um, so, how do you? If you're into science fiction and games and puzzles and you want to write about this kind of stuff or experience it, the only way to do it is 
through this kind of stuff we're trying to do in the journal, making them better than that. Another answer, the New York Public Library is the only public library I can see that has it. Okay. But it's in a number of academic research libraries. Yeah. Yeah, the New York Public Library has done a great job collecting things. They've been better in some cases than other public libraries. Um, I have one, one other question about the reception. Were there like uh, chat rooms or online fora or anything where people were discussing these works and discussing like their own kind of playthroughs or read-throughs of it? Well, the well is where Judy Malloy's work was discussed. And Howard Weingold, the famous theorist, you know, you probably heard of Weingold a lot and a lot, he set up a special BBS, a you know, bulletin board site for Judy Malloy's Uncle Roger. So there were the in these instances where geeky people who loved this work, you know, fans and supporters would get together and talk about them there. We talked about it in Postmodern Culture, which was run by Stuart Malthrop. We talked about it in Megabyte University, which Eric Crumb ran for a long time, which then became TechRet. So there were these kind of arcane spaces that people would get together and, you know, play and talk and, you know, you know, discuss this stuff. It, were those discussions archived? Or were they I've not seen an archive. I don't think Megabyte University, that's a good question. Megabyte University, I think, was totally gone, and it got subsumed by TechRep, so I don't think they kept those old servers. I mean, that's a problem with these servers. And I have, if you think about it, on the <coughs> old server I was on at Texas Women's University and at UT Dallas, there was a lot of stuff of my own writing about this stuff. But that's gone because that was running super old server software, and the and the email archive that I had of this stuff was on Pine and Elm, which is very arcane technology. I miss Pine. I miss Pine. I miss Elm, but they're gone. And I've even tried to go back and, and get my hands on it, thinking they put it in on tape. And I wanted to have that stuff for my collection here and I've contacted the libraries, they don't have them. They didn't keep them. And that is sad because that was the time in which we were starting to make that shift from this environment here to that environment wherever that was. Yeah. You know? And it's kind of like you think for students to think about this, you know, imagine you're playing games now in Steam, right? But you grew up playing games on console with cassettes and the shift from that moment to this moment was huge for you and imagine in 20 years you're not going to have these cassettes anymore all you have is this and there's no record of your play or your fan stuff from this environment you're going to really be as nostalgic for that as I am for <laughs> this does that make sense? And so what can we, and why is that important? Well, it's not just nostalgia, but it shows how our intellectual processes change. Because what it took to play with these things is very different than it, what it takes to uh, play in this ephemeral cloud environment. Different brain processes, different experiences. And that shift is huge for human cognition, understanding and all those things that make you different than me. We're different. This makes us different. And that's not a bad thing, but it is the truth. Right? Do you know how many copies were sold or distributed of this text? Great question. I'll ask Mark that question too. He may not tell me, but certainly he's got some of these in, I still in inventory, and I'm going to buy a few more. I mean, I'm trying to buy, I mean, this is expensive stuff. You know, whenever I get my hands on some grant money or I get some money, I'll buy more copies of things. And I try to have at least two copies of, and this isn't even opened yet. I haven't even opened this one. But I'll buy some more copies of it so I can open at least two copies of this. It shows that it's, like, you can still click it on, you put it in your cart on Eastgate's website. Yeah, he yeah. still has, and he's keep them buying. And I asked for two more copies of this. But he may, my records show he now has, he has 44 different works, different objects with work on it that he sold during 1990-ish to about, well, to, to the present time. But mm -hmm. the, publica the most recent publication was Those Trojan Girls by Mark Bernstein. 
and then not much, you know, there's a kind of demarcation between that and then I guess 10 years ago. Is there another name for this? Like hypertext? It's called hypertext narrative. Yeah. Because you keep calling it an object. Well, I'm talking about this oh, thing, yeah. this this thing. I mean, this whole thing. I mean, this is. I, we call this a folio. Mm -hmm. Inside the folio is a diskette, and that diskette holds a work that's hypertext narrative. So it's to to come up with the languaging for this has been interesting, right? But we call it an artifact. Okay. Yeah. Any other direct questions? Is this interesting to you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll stop the traversal, I guess. It's okay. 130 ish. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>